Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel this morning, Beyond the Horizon Scenarios with Near Peer Adversaries, is moderated by Ms. Andrea Goldstein, the CEO of Service to School. Ms. Goldstein. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I hope you enjoyed some coffee at the break. Um, I am really looking forward to this panel um, on over the horizon uh, threats and near peer adversaries. Um, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. I am joined by Dr. David Johnson, principal researcher at the Rand Corporation, adjunct professor at Georgetown, and retired Army officer. Mr. Isaac Stone Fish, journalist and senior <coughs> fellow at the Asia Society Center on US China relations. Mr. Michael Kaufman, director of the Russia Studies Program at CNA, fellow at the Kennan Institute. And at CNA, Mr. Kaufman specializes in the Russian armed forces and security issues in the former Soviet Union. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Antonio Echevarria from the US Army War College. He is the editor of Parameters and author of several books and currently working on a new one. So some background on this panel. Um, each panelist will speak for eight minutes. Um, and then we will open it up. Uh, I'll start with some questions and we'll open it up to questions. Cadets, we haven't seen any questions from you so far, so we would love if you could think about um, what you'd like to ask this panel. Um, and also, as you think about your questions, please make sure it's a question. I came in here last night. If you ask a question that's actually not a, a comment, a trap door will open and you will be swallowed whole. Um, so the previous four panels examined various potential disruptors to America's military dominance. <clears throat> and so this panel is meant to be more forward-looking, provide a no-kidding, over-the-horizon perspective on American warfare um, uh, to come, and uh, the best net assessment of what great power conflict might look like in the 21st century. And so because you're here to hear these gentlemen speak, Dr. Johnson, I cede the floor to you. Okay, well, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure, one, to be on a panel with a bunch of friends whose work I really respect. I want to build on some of the things Eric Wesley talked about because I think it's why the Army Futures Command is so important to our Army at this point. Uh, the theme of my talk is going to be, it's going to be how we look forward to peer competition and how badly we've done it in the past. Uh, so the theme of my talk today is caught in the middle between Luddites, luminaries, and the occasional loony. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the challenges uh, that getting re ready for the next big thing has been for the Army since World War I and their implications for how we're going to get ready for the future. I believe the Army, contrary to how it talks about itself, has always been a concepts-based organization, not a doctrine-based institution. Um, there's been one exception that I'll talk to later. Unfortunately, as doctrinal solutions evolve in war after the failure of its concepts in its first battle, which the Army has historically lost uh, from Long Island in the Revolution, uh, First Bull Run, Bataan, Buna, Kasserine Pass, Task Force Smith, LZ Albany, and the aftermath of OIF-1 when we transitioned from what we thought was a victory in a long-term insurgency. I believe the reason the Army fails in its first battles is because its concepts are initially, until tested in combat, a statement of how the Army wants to fight and rarely an analytical assessment of how it will have to fight. And these concepts drive capabilities. Potential adversaries, their capabilities in the place where the conflict might occur, the problem a concept has to solve, have rarely been fundamental to Army concept development. The agenda for our conference notes that we are at an inflection point of history akin to the one that followed the First World War. Strategic bombing, blitzkrieg, and nuclear warfare would come to define the next phase of war. I agree. And we'll turn now to what the Army did in the face of these pivotal cha changes in the character of war in the past as a way to understand the challenges of the future. The inner wars of talk I have spent a lot of time studying. Uh, I think it's really useful to understand the Army's experience with new technologies after World War I to get a sense of how our culture deals with these things. After World War I, all the great powers had been exposed to tanks, airplanes, and radios, but only Germany developed the Blitzkrieg. Why is that? I examine this in my book, Fast Tanks and Heavy Bombers. But in the Army, mechanization became the captive of conservative infantry and cavalry branches who saw technology through the lens of improving what they already did. Tanks became infantry support weapons or iron horses for traditional cavalry missions. Or worse, as in the case of Major General John Hare, the last chief of cavalry, 
He actively worked to block mechanization to maintain horse cavalry strength in the Army, uh, and he controlled his budget. His approach to mechanization is best summed up in a statement, which I couldn't believe I ever found this. It's great. Quote, when w better roller skates are made, cavalry horses will wear them. <laughs> so his big innovation was to put horse cavalry on tractor trailers to give them strategic mobility to get to a battlefield where he still thought they were relevant. Importantly, he ran the cavalry branch until 1942, and when he was in his final meeting, as it turned out, with General Marshall was saying, if we don't get more horses in the Army, we might lose World War II. Uh, General Marshall <laughs> got rid of all the Army's horses, and he also got rid of General Hare. Uh, so in 1940, the, cavalry, uh, the armored forces formed over the objection of the infantry and the cavalry after the fall of Poland and France. A central assumption was that armored force concepts was that tank destroyers would handle the adversary's tanks, and American tanks and armored divisions were there for exploitation and pursuit in traditional cavalry missions. This turned out to be a very bad assumption. General Omar Bradley's army group lost over 4,000 tanks between D-Day and the end of the war less than a year later. Interestingly, Army armored concepts did not envision the need for air support, one of the other key emerging technologies of the interwar period. This would have been very difficult given that the air arm was focused on developing concepts to make it a decisive force to gain its independence from the Army through daylight strategic bombing. Thus, the Air Corps shaped the aviation technology in a direction to prove its strategic value uh, through daylight precision bombing of the enemy's industrial web, which would cause a collapse of his industrial capacity. Indeed, Army Air Force officers were briefing President Roosevelt in 1941 on their plan and said if they got enough resources, the invasion of Europe by our ground forces would not be necessary. Thus, there was no American blitzkrieg, which at its core was a German focus on a problem. Defeating France that required joint concepts and combining two transformative technologies, the tank and the airplane, through the radio. Neither the Army's ground or air constituencies demanded such cooperation. Another key point I've observed or studied over the years is that I get very dry very quickly. <laughs> is that the Army grasps at new technologies because it believes what it's doing is not compelling enough to win in the battle for resources on the Hill. In this regard, the Army's approach to modernization response to the Eisenhower New Look that cut conventional forces and relied on the doctrine of mass and nuclear retaliation is an interesting case study. This is when the Army went all out to organize and equip for relevance. The days of the Pentomic Division and the proliferation of nuclear weapons from the small Davy Crockett launcher, you couldn't shoot it far enough not to kill yourself, to nuclear howitzers and air defense systems like the Nike Hercules. And this was also driven from above. At one point, Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson returned the Army's budget to General Maxwell Taylor and told him, get the Army staff to substitute newfangled equipment that Congress would support and place a budget request for unglamorous weapons and equipment such as rifles, machine guns, and truck which had little appeal for Congress or the nation. Basevich, Andy Basevich's assessment of this period is very useful. Quote, the futurists who proclaimed that changing technology was reshaping the face of warfare succeeded only in laying the service open to doctrinal fads. Michael Finch wrote recently in Journal of Military History, such was the powerful of hypothetical nuclear confrontation that even the record of more recognizable conventional wars in such places as Korea and Vietnam could not shake the position of those theoreticians who confidently offered solutions which appealed to the military. Similarly, um, in the mid-1960s, one of my mentors, Duke historian Ted Ropp, noted, quote, a fascination with gadgets such as electronics and cost accounting still grips the military and civilian components of the Defense Department. Our military intellectuals pander to this market for panaceas. Even the works of the abler ones so, are so solution-oriented that they are quickly dated. One positive example I've found all this is, as Eric Wesley talked about, was the Army's development of concepts and capabilities in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. The Army studied the Soviets, their capabilities, and the likely place of conflict, resulted in technologies and concepts of employment with clear metrics to measure their performance against the threat and drove changes across the Army to create formations able to fight and win in a very difficult environment, which turned out to be deterrent. Uh, the Army also conducted honest operational experiments under realistic conditions to test the efficacy 
and potential of its concepts. And these experiments and exercises helped evolve the Army from active defense to new versions of air land battle in 10 years. And while the Army's big five weapons of the 1980s represented a major increase in capability, these systems, such as the Abrams and Bradley, were based on known proven technologies that minimized risk of major program failure. The Army abandoned threat-based concept and capability development after the Cold War. I believe this is the reason the future combat systems resulted in the largest programmatic failure in the history of the department. Over 200 or $20 billion spent on a system that was never deployed. Nevertheless, between the end of the Cold War and 2006, Army concepts and doctrine also became an implicit statement of the, what the Army would not do. And a concept for counterinsurgency to deal with the chaos in Iraq that had formed after the war had to be hastily developed and rushed to the field because we had no idea. In the future, the Army has to be prepared to do more than one thing at a time. Um, conclusion, I'd offer a couple of final observations. Much of the talk about the future in technology is reminiscent of that in the interwar nuclear hours and should raise important questions as the Army goes forward. Are new technologies really going to change everything, like the advocates of strategic bombing and nuclear weapons argued? Or, as U.S. ground force leaders argued, are they going to just improve what we already do? Turns out both camps are incorrect uh, before World War II, and the Army missed the opportunity to combine available new technologies like the Germans did with the Blitzkrieg. I think the principal lesson in all this is that the Army must have a clear problem that it is trying to solve to remain to, to able to innovate. And I would caution that innovation is generally not invention. These, there are important lessons from this period uh, in the 70s. I think one of the most important is it resulted in the close cooperation of two services who wouldn't even talk to each other in the interwar period, the Army and the Air Force, because there was a problem in Europe that they could not solve independently, had to co cooperate, thus air land battle. I also believe the new national defense strategy provides the Army with the potential adversaries and places that we might fight and should be the drivers for innovation. And we generally know what our adversaries are going to do to 2025. They actually publish it. And you can find things at places like Injik that are in great detail about things they don't publish. And while the Russians and the Chinese are pursuing cyber, space, and AI, they're also making significant investments in modernizing their conventional and nuclear capabilities. Thus, I believe we have all the information we need for threat-based analysis to guide concept and capability development to ensure we're prepared to fight the next battle and win. Thank you, I look forward to your comments. Thank you, and I'm supposed to remind everyone this conversation is on the record, so please feel free to tweet away. Um, Mr. Stonefish. Thank you. <laughs> so, who here is familiar with the gay dating and hookup app Grindr? Just by show of hands. Who's heard of that? Okay, so Grindr, you may be wondering why I'm talking about Grindr in a session about the future of warfare. Uh, Grindr is a Chinese company. About a year ago, it was purchased by a Chinese billionaire, Zhou Yahui. Chinese Tibetan runs a very successful gaming company called Beijing Quinlan Technology Media. We don't really have any evidence that he has specifically close links to the Communist Party. However, now, all of the data that is on Grindr belongs in the hands of a Chinese billionaire whose fortune, whose life, whose freedom is directly at the hands of the Communist Party. So Joe might not have any designs when he purchased Grindr to use it as any sort of exploitable tech weapon, but Beijing is certainly aware that this exists, and if someone asks Joe, or if PLA officers are using this technology without his awareness, well, there's a lot of really fun things they could do with that. So I'm talking about today is political warfare, the idea of really fighting without weapons. I'm going to bastardize Swinza a little bit here, but uh, the highest, I think he said, the highest type of warfare is defeating your enemy's plans, sapping the will to fight. So it's not really hard to imagine that if things get worse between Beijing and DC, Beijing using its advances in AI and data recognition to process a lot of data from Grindr to find targets in the military, in the government, who seem like they'd be susceptible to either blackmail or persuasion, and then just putting people in the right place at the right time. 
So a lot of what China does now with honeypotting is, is sort of less, feels less regimented than what the Russians do. Um, so this is on the record, I'm gonna be a little vague here, but uh, I had the pleasure of <laughs> meeting one of these uh, honeypots a few years ago because uh, she knew a contact of mine. And a lot of it is somewhat adventurism. And I, I think a lot of it that we can imagine Beijing doing with something like Grindr is less a very specific plan, but more putting someone, you know, putting an attractive young gentleman in the right place with a certain closeted official in the military, in the government, and seeing what happens. So what I want to talk about are ways that Beijing can fight without weapons and then what we can do about it. So Grindr is one. I'm going to talk a little bit about the OPM hack as well. There's a lot of ways we can think about weaponizing that data. So for example, emptying the bank accounts of certain servicemen stationed in Japan as a way of just freaking them out or tweeting threats at them or their family as a way to sapping the will to fight. But another strategy that I think gets a lot less attention and should get more is what's called flooding the zone. So putting out a lot of really positive information that changes the way that people see China. Oversimplifying here, the difference between the Russia threat, Russian influence in America, and China's influence in America is Russian is more about chaos. China is more about China. China is about how Americans see China, how Chinese Americans, how Chinese in America see China, and what's written in Chinese about China. Beijing's goal, uh, if we really boil it down, is for the party to stay in power. And everything that they do to a certain degree is trying to help the party stay in power. So with flooding the zone, what Beijing could do is it could target influential people who have had their data compromised by the OPM hack and just make sure, you know, target ads to them that talk about how wonderful China is. And everyone has seen these ads and everyone has seen, you know, has read China Daily and, you know, most people who read it and see it think, oh God, this is bullshit propaganda. I'm too smart for this. I don't need to worry about this. Um, there are certain phrases that Chinese officials, Chinese military, Chinese interlocutors will say that if you say it enough, it sticks in your head and it's translated into the American discourse about China. So I'll give an example. The phrase, the party has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, is a phrase that you often hear Americans and Chinese say when you're talking about the positives of the Communist Party. Is this phrase true? Well, sure, yes. It's certainly a way of thinking about what the party did. But it's a party-planted phrase that changes our narrative about the party and makes us speak in the ways that they want us to speak. So it's easy to imagine other targeted phrases being entered into the mind, entered into the discourse, that changes the way we see the threat of China. So China's two goals in political warfare. Um, one is either to convince the US that it's not a threat. You don't have to worry about it. China is a developing country. I'm sure all of you have heard Chinese people say that. Oh yeah, the US is the largest developed country. China is the largest developing country. You know, we've lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but we have still so many domestic challenges that we have to handle. Sure, true, that's fine. That doesn't mean that we can't think smartly and critically about the threat that China poses. The other side of that, and which is starting to become more of the discourse, is it's inevitable that China will dominate Asia. This is how things are gonna be. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen. So this is another idea that we could start seeing entered more into the bloodstream via targeted messaging to people targeted by the opium hack, to more money spent on CGTN, China Daily, other propaganda outlets, or just more conversations with people like us when we go and visit Beijing or when Chinese come here and they make these statements and they say them enough and people talk in enough of a concerted voice that we start to believe it. Uh, the other thing that they're pushing for is for Americans to lose the support of Taiwan. That's the other, that, that I would say is Beijing's paramount foreign policy goal. Uh, they don't call it a foreign policy goal because they think it's a domestic issue and they insist that it's a domestic issue. And this is sort of another way that we somehow get locked in their language. You know, if they keep saying it's a domestic issue, then we think, oh right, this is something that they should settle. When you go to a Chinese airport, it's really funny. There's, there's domestic flights, and then there's international Taiwan, Macau, Hong Kong flights. You know? But you had all this, this big issue with airlines saying that Taiwan was international.
well, Chinese Air Force called them international. It's that they were allowed themselves to get bullied, to get cowed into placing Taiwan in a different category that Beijing itself pushed. A third thing that Beijing could do is take the Singapore strategy with media and companies. So I think the last time this happened was about eight years ago, but the International Herald Tribune, which used to be independent from the New York Times, uh, had to publish an apology to the government of Singapore. So in the New York Times, you see them apologizing to the government of Singapore because someone alleged that uh, Li Xianlong, the son of Li Kuan Yew, got his position towards nepotism. Okay, he's the son of a leader, but you know, you're not allowed to say in a Singaporean context that that had anything to do with nepotism. So the New York Times, the best newspaper out there in my opinion, apologized to the government of Singapore for a very, very, you know, this is on the record, so you know, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> They're very good courts, but a very, very reasonable thing. You know, you're allowed to make that allegation, you're allowed to assume that there's a relationship between the father and son of Singapore running the country and the second wife of the current Prime Minister of Singapore running Temasek, the sovereign wealth fund. But the Singapore has excellent courts. Uh, they're very litigious. They have very strong libel laws. Mm -hmm. They sued. The Times apologized. They paid a settlement. And that was that. Beijing doesn't do that. Uh, it does not have the level of rule of law. It doesn't have the confidence. It doesn't have the desire. Hong Kong has an excellent legal system. And it's not hard to imagine at some point in the not too distant future if Hong Kong becomes firmer under Beijing control for Hong Kong judges to bring suits or Hong Kong lawyers bring suits against American media publications for alleging that Xi Jinping is a dictator or that Xi Jinping you know, has untoward desires towards America or towards other countries in the region or you know, really any of these red lines. And all it takes is one or two successful cases and people are cowed. American media companies did not want to leave Singapore. Very profitable places for them to be. It's a really good regional base. They don't want to leave Hong Kong either. I mean, Hong Kong is sort of the place that they can be to engage with China, to engage with other countries in the region. And, you know, a few successful lawsuits will really change the way that they cover China. How much more time do I got? You have 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay. Uh, in conclusion, what we do about this, uh, we can't out China China. We can't try to do that. We have to work on rectifying the names. I'll just leave with a very brief anecdote. Uh, South China Sea. In Chinese, no one calls it the South China Sea. They call it the South Sea. East China Sea. In Chinese, no one calls it the East China Sea. They call it the East Sea. So when we say, oh gosh, we worry about China's militarization in the South China Sea, well, of course, it's their sea. But if we say we worry about China's militarization in the South Sea, it's a lot more open. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about Russia, and since I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to be able to get through in time, I'm just going to give kind of what I think is the bottom line up front at the very beginning, which is, uh, at least in the last two days, this fascinating set of discussions, what I kind of heard would, I think would be met with considerable disagreement, at least in Moscow, on what a likely war would look like with the United States. And because there's a lot of sort of core assumptions that Russia not only had never agreed to, but um, in many ways, the United States never solved the fundamental problems of 20th century warfare, and, there's, and, and there's, there's a bit of amnesia going into the 21st century warfare, simply talking about certain things that don't exist. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I don't think there's any chance of a large-scale, prolonged, industrial-scale conflict with Russia and the European continent. The bad news is because I think it'll be really fast, and it'll be over pretty quickly in a matter of weeks. One side's way of war will prove decisive versus the other side's way of war, Certain people's assumptions will be proven right. Other people's assumptions will be proven wrong. And if Russia is decidedly on the losing end of that conventional conflict, they will use nuclear weapons. And then things will go very badly from there. And that was always going to be the case. In fact, that was assumed to be the case um, pretty much since 1949. Yeah. And it's really strange because whenever I hear about a prolonged land warfare, industrial war with Russia and Europe, it sounds like people are really missed out on technological developments between the years of 1945 and 2018. All right, so, over the past 30 years, um, the emphasis of Russian military reform modernization has been, one, to establish an effective conventional deterrent and counter to the U.S. way of war, right, which is principally non-contact warfare with standoff weapons. Second, to then rebuild the conventional forces, destroy the Soviet mass mobilization army they inherited, and stand up a permanent standing military that is able to effectively impose Russian will on countries 
on Russia's borders, right? It's simply not possible to do that missile, missile defense, air defense, or air power. At the end of the day, you need ground force to do that. Third, to establish a fairly robust toolkit for indirect competition and direct warfare, which works very well with the conventional toolkits, this understanding that most objectives of Russian foreign policy are on Russia's borders, not far away. Russia very rarely plays away games, and even when it does, in the case of Syria, it's an adjacent theater at best, right? So it's a strong integration between the curse of diplomacy and the fact you have when you have a sizable conventional military force and various forms of uh, indirect competition. And last but not least, invest in what are Russian strength, which is nuclear modernization, nuclear weapons development, actually nuclear propulsion for weapons too, and really uh, build a much more usable toolkit of non-strategic nuclear weapons. No, I won't say tactical, and there's a distinction. Um, our terminology is not really at all the same with Russia, and so if you think that from Russian perspective, things that are tactical are things that happen within the 100 kilometer range and tactical operations like 100 uh, to 500 and then um, non-strategic is really things in the 500 to 2500 kilometer range. There's a whole set and a really robust arsenal of weapons that are specifically designed for that operational non-strategic range. And they're quite credible and use them. How does this all begin? Well, um, most of the current military thinking of Russia dates back to the late 1970s, early 1980s period under Marshal Garkov, and it really um, is probably the, the intellectual father of the current reforms, where in the early 1980s, uh, Soviet general staff began noticing the United States was engaging in very weird behavior, which was the U.S. military was pursuing what uh, Soviet Union was calling an independent conventional war option. The United States was no longer committed to a nuclear holocaust and was trying to see if we could have a conventional war only with the Soviet Union over some period of weeks and time, and potentially win it without having to resort to nuclear escalation. And so the Soviet general staff got very worried. They began thinking, so precision weapons, long-range conventional standoff munitions, would begin to have strategic effects, and they replaced tactical nuclear weapons from 50s, 60s, and 70s in terms of what they were meant for on the battlefield. And so Soviet general staff began moving tactical nuclear weapons into the, into the role of intra-war deterrence, right, an escalation management role, believing that for some weeks it was possible to have a conventional-only war with the United States, and this is the direction where, where things were going in the 1980s. And the initial sort of Soviet debate on the utility of conventional cruise missiles and attacking command and control, destroying Russian nuclear infrastructure, taking out Russian nuclear forces, and disaggregating really begins around 1984, and from there on came a general conclusion that U.S. cruise missile arsenal and long-range standoff munitions de facto have strategic effect. That this is a strategic conventional arsenal and it's able to rip apart other countries and affect regime change. Um, and of course, the logical assumption was that the purpose of U.S. force development was going to be surprise and preemption because, well, the general staff culture there has a very strong first strike bias, particularly ever since Operation Barbarossa, so it's quite conservative and fatalistic um, in that nature. And that's really, that's in part born of a country with no natural borders, uh, whereas the United States policy community is endlessly optimistic, and that's what leads to repeated nation-building campaigns in the Middle East. Um, you know, sort of like, we'll give it a go. Uh, and, and, so we're talking about today what really bothers Russian general staff. What, what is actually the driver of all these military developments, right? I'm not here to talk about all the different toys and capabilities. One, there are no longer operational pauses in conflict. This is really annoying because the Russian military excels at the operational level of war. We are tactically really good. If my grandfather was here, he'd say, we're amazing. But of course, he'd also say, you know, Germany was also tactically really good. But I remember storming Berlin. So that's issue one. Issue two. Modern war features persistent effects to the depths of adversary lines. There's no spatial distance. Russia's fundamentally a Eurasian land army, and as an army, it is an artillery army with lots of tanks, and it always had been. I do get frequently annoyed. People recently have discovered, like, Russia, Russian army, and then they have artillery. And I say, yeah, for 300 years, they've had a lot of artillery. They've also had lots of tanks. Starting from the interwar period, they had lots of tanks. In fact, there was Hitler's main complaint in Finland later on down the line where he said he actually had no idea how many tanks the Soviet Union had when they invaded, and if he knew how many they had, he might have thought a bit differently about the course of the campaign. Um, so from their perspective, right, their big issues, particularly today, due to cyber warfare, information warfare, and asymmetric means, they are not kinetic means that basically affect the depth of the country's line. That's my question some days back about to what extent is limited conventional war possible if at the outset of limited conventional war you have to target the homeland of the other state to gain key advantages in ISR, in information, in, in delaying them, in logistics, space, all these things you'd have to go after very early on at the beginning. So it really doesn't matter that the conflicts in the Baltics or anywhere else. There's no way to do it without direct homeland impact in the first day. And this creates certain fundamental challenges. Um, next. So the general Russian conclusion, and I will disappoint my army colleagues here, that the principal U.S. way of war, post-1980s, is airspace blitzkrieg and decapitating strikes. 
ripping apart integrated air defense from the adversary, then can't opening the entire military, and after that, it doesn't matter. And this goes very, very quickly. Um, and, and therefore, it made no sense to assume that ground warfare would at all be decisive versus the Western way of war, and, and that the United States had largely displaced most of its fire and strike systems into the airspace and maritime domain. So the Russian military really retooled its thinking and said, okay, 1980s, the, deci the decisive force in conflict would be operational maneuver group, and it would be basically land force, mechanized force moving in first. And so it's actually the complete opposite sequencing today, right? Today, the airspace, the contest between uh, American air power and Russian air defense will prove decisive, and Russian land forces will be second, third mover, and honestly, if the air defense is gone, it won't matter because they're basically going to become the Iraqi army, only much better with more expensive gear at that stage, right? Um, and so uh, what, what kind of came out of that is that there's a strong desire to counter what Russia began seeing as um, sort of an American strategic triad that was non-nuclear. The first part of it was America's gigantic conventional cruise missile arsenal. The second part of it was American investment in missile defense. And those come together because you have to understand that in, in the mindset there, there is always a belief that the, the, the focus of Russian forces is to be postured counter surprise. This is for very obvious reasons if you ever lived in the Soviet Union in 1941, right? Because the fundamental belief of that country is that the other side is preparing for a disarming strike and after destroying a substantial amount of command and control of nuclear weapons, they will try to pick up what's left of missile defense. Down the line, 20, 30 years from now, I'm not talking today, right? That culture thinks at least 30 years ahead what technology will look like. So this really led them to develop a conventional deterrent um, and find a way to, to de facto uh, focus on one. How do you blunt or survive sort of a Western aerospace attack? Um, how do you suppress it? How do you retaliate against it? And how do you deal with the fact that for at least a couple of weeks you're looking at a really high-end conventional conflict until one side runs out of precision munitions or one side runs out of aircraft or the other side runs out of air defense. So the air defense is totally disintegrated and so there's a giant cliff, even initially a butcher's bill, and at the end of that cliff, the ability to resist actually rapidly trails off. Um, and so the, the kind of focus came around into one, organize around strategic operations that integrate forces and forms of warfare and focus on the adversaries of the system, targeting the ability and, and will to sustain the fight. And that sort of emphasis on logistics, information, and critical infrastructure. And second, to develop um, recon strike and recon fire complex that would basically allow the Russian military to solve one of the fundamental problems of the Soviet military. Since the Russian military inherited a lot of advantages and disadvantages of Soviet armed forces, and one of the ones they inherited was that the Soviet military was a brutal mauler and incredibly effective at killing stuff, but they couldn't see very well. It was like me without glasses. And so if it could find and fix anything, it could finish. And it had a lot of arsenal that fell very well into the bracket called close enough. But, but it couldn't see well at all. And so Russian military has been working very hard to develop its capabilities, particularly the tactical operational range, right? Because it has, yes, it has rate of fire and stand up and all these things. But it doesn't matter if you can't see. Right? It makes very little difference. And so, and so they're becoming, particularly as a result of a lot of experience in Syria, they're becoming a lot more tactically innovative, which is a very new thing for the Russian military because I'll be frank, while strategy does always look backwards and is informed by previous conflicts, tactics have to be based on technology of today. And the Russian military is a big problem, which is it still fundamentally had been until the conflict in Syria informed by tactics and success and experience of World War II, right? And it's heavily shaped by it. And Syria is leading a transformation of tactical experience and innovation in the Russian armed forces. And I'm happy to take the rest into Q&A. Thank you. All right, Dr. Tobiah, take us home. Yep, thank you. Uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I feel a little bit like I should offer a ray of hope uh, for the American way of war moving forward. After everything we've heard over the last uh, several panels, uh, the clouds look a bit dark out there. Um, so I think there is a, a, a way forward, but I don't think it's going to be easy. It's going to be, require a fair amount of work. Uh, so first let me explain what I mean by the American way of war, for me, it's simply the historical patterns of thought and of practice that Americans have used with respect to armed conflict. You can't know those patterns except historically because they have to happen in order for you to, uh, to appreciate and to analyze them. Uh, but to reduce the American way of war to a simple choice between strategies of attrition or uh, annihilation, as Russell widely did, in my view, is misleading. Instead, our way of war has really been one of adaptation to the nature of war at hand. Um, 
problem we get into is when we adapt too slowly, and we start to lose public support, uh, support of our allies, and we look like we're uh, incompetent for the tasks that are before us and the things we have to handle. Uh, so uh, one of the characteristics of the American way of war over the 20th century, the modern era, has really been not attrition, but rather decapitation, as already mentioned. The idea of neutralizing hostile parties and removing their leaders. Uh, this is largely because of our many interventions in Latin America and along the Pacific. But it's also inaccurate to say that uh, our first choice is military force. Usually, our first choice is economic pressure. Uh, we see this pattern from Truman onward. In fact, there are exceptions to every rule. But especially because of the uh, circumstances of the Cold War, the idea was to apply some economic force first, send in some CIA folks, and perhaps augment them with special forces. And then, if that still failed, then ramp up to conventional forces. So again, when um, our expectations don't meet the war we're in, and we have difficulty adjusting to it, uh, the problem is that it's usually because our going at assumptions had been, in my view, too narrow. Um, and let me uh, try to explain that a little bit. Um, so the most profitable way for us to, to move forward is to develop an integrated view of warfare, one that brings in all of war's dimensions. A very difficult time doing that, and I will uh, illustrate via a chart that I think will economize some of the words here. Uh, can I have that chart, please? In the meantime, so we take a, we hear a lot about the Clausewitzian Trinity, and I take that as a useful start point because it does talk about three dimensions of war. And under the point of the discussion in the first chapter of On War is really a message to the theorist, He's trying to say the nature of war depends on our analysis of the social cultural dimension, political dimension, the military dimension, the forces engaged. To see it only as uh, the forces or only as the institutions, I think, creates an error by separating the two. The, a point for the uh, reformers, which Clausewitz was one, and right after uh, being defeated by Napoleon, is that these forces, if aligned together, aligned properly, can create a synergy that takes war to another level. So and that was a Napoleonic model of war. And it only occurs, really, uh, in three cases historically. Um, by his analysis. So it's the ancient Roman wars, um, the wars of the Mongols, and then the Napoleonic model. So the Prussians are trying to replicate this model by bringing civilian, uh, civilian folks into the military and into the government to participate more and to capitalize and leverage this warlike spirit. This is the key uh, that for him um, is what transformed war in this period. So it wasn't a technological revolution, it was a social revolution, um, social, political, to a certain extent. Um, and it, so for us, it's a start point um, to analyze the way we move forward with uh, the way we understand the dimensions of war. What we need to really do is figure out whether those three dimensions are enough. Um, Michael Handel in the late 1970s and 1980s uh, argued that we ought to square the Trinity by adding a technological dimension. And, uh, and we can argue whether or not that's actually useful or not, but the, pro the threat of nuclear annihilation meant that technology now is much more important than it ever was in Clausewitz's day. Not much changed technologically for him, again, the key was the social dimension and unleashing that and leveraging it for uh, the, the uh, uh, for the prosecution of war. And altogether, these create a momentum, a logic of its own, if you will, which uh, clouds it backed off a bit later and says, well, the, the logic really is a political one. But nonetheless, um, it's important to understand that the, uh, the synergistic effect of these dimensions together um, uh, are the important, are the key here. Um, what we don't have in the American way of looking at the canon of our strategic thinkers is seemingly the ability to think about more than one or two dimensions of war at a time. 
we were pretty good at looking at mm -hmm. the military and economic dimension. Mahan was probably the first to explicitly link these two, though in practice that was already being done, certainly by the Civil War with Sherman and others. Um, but looking at Brody, for instance, one of the leaders in, in limited war thinking of the time, um, he lives in the western side of Los Angeles at a time when the Watts riots are raging, 1965, middle of August. And more than 30 people were killed, $40 million or so of damage is done, many other people are, are injured, and none of this makes its way into any of his theories. Um, the, uh, the social dimension is overlooked, even though at this time in the United States is a social revolution of sorts underway. Uh, the Vietnam era in the 1960s, very tumultuous. It really was a social revolution that perhaps didn't go um, all the way to fruition, but it did, did change public attitudes, the willingness to participate in war, um, to volunteer, and to fight well once conscripted. So by the 1970s, the U.S. military is struggling to, uh, it has lots of internal problems related to its personnel, its morale, and all of this. So that, that's part of it. But none of this makes it into any of his voluminous theories uh, and writings about war itself. And we seem to have this problem still throughout to the modern era, to the contemporary period. So what we need to do, um, rather than focusing on one or two, is attempt to identify which dimensions of war matter to us the most. We're going to add an economic dimension and a technological dimension. Uh, then we need to probably investigate and discuss those in more detail. And we need to decide, in terms of um, theory, how on earth we can pull these together into something that's coherent and it reflects the, uh, those dimensions, the advantages and disadvantages of those, to what extent they're interrelated, and whether or not any synergies might be obtained through the combination of those dimensions in our way of war moving forward. So, uh, I'm doing on time. You crushed it. All right, so then basically I will uh, just wrap up by saying um, <laughs> that I think there's some profit to going um, back to the theories of control advanced by Rosinski, uh, Henry Eccles, and Joseph Wiley, basically because it was an unfinished theory, but they tried to integrate, Rosinski calls this situation a strategic anarchy. And it's not chaos, but there are individual regimes of thought, individual schools of thought that are operating semi-independently, and there is no coherent way to bring it back. But I think control as an umbrella concept can help bring us back to that point where we've got um, some reasonable um, uh, control of the situation. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll kick it off with Q&A, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, first, so I'm going to ask two questions. One I have to ask because it's come up the entire conference, and one is, are we at war? And then the second is, how do you consider major demographic and population shifts? And a big example is the result of China's one-child policy resulting in missing women and a surplus of men um, in line with a rapidly aging population. How will that impact the future of conflict? say we are not at war, but the Chinese are. Well, I think the challenge when you say that word, it is a signifier for something that's not universally agreed on. So what do you mean by war? Uh, what do you mean by conflict? I mean, there's a, a great writer named um, Walter Hong who wrote about oral cultures and literate cultures. And he went and did research in the hinterlands of Russia where they'd never seen a car, nobody had ever read a book. And he drove up in a bus and he said, you know, what's that? It was a house on wheels with couches. And there's got to be a horse in there because it moves. So there's no signifier for bus. So what do we mean when we say war? And is it universally understood by the audiences we're trying to talk about? I mean, I'll just add that, though I, I, I don't think we're in a war, but it, fundamentally we'd have to split that between indirect warfare and direct warfare. And the fact that, I mean, at least the country I focus on fundamentally understands that there's a strong spectrum of competition to confrontation, and that normative state uh, of peace doesn't really exist in contest. And so um, it cannot be viewed as like a football game with a starting and ending point, right? So 
war should, I, and, I, and I do often write this, I do dislike when people say, well, we are at war with Russia. No, we're not, because you have time to write op-eds in Washington Post about it. Like I said, if we were at war with Russia, it'd be over really fast. So we're not at war. That's the good news, all right? But we are in a, in a confrontation. Um, and, and, and frankly, it, the reality is that how you manage that competition over time determines whether or not you actually do or do not get into war. So that was at least what the essence of, of the Cold War was. Um, and I'll briefly touch on demographic population shift. I love this topic. This is one of my favorite kind of myths about Russia. Um, uh, I normally in DC, I am treated to a wonderful conversation where I'm typically informed that Russia doesn't have a long game because of economic demographic challenges. So, I mean, Americans are, we are endless optimists. We believe that Russia, which has been around for 500 years, will collapse on our watch and will be the next 10. It's like winning the lottery is highly unlikely. Um, uh, Russia, has, Russia has real demographic challenges, although like the United States it maintains its population to immigration, so as a net uh, migration bonus. But Russia's likely to go down from 145 million to either 134 or, or 129 um, by 2050. So it's going to decline from being the most populous state in Europe to being the most populous state in Europe. And yeah, it'd be tremendous. Um, and, and, and then down the line by by uh, over the next eight years, 2100, it may decline to about 120. Um, there's a real, the, the, the essence to me of that question, actually, sorry to take it to this place, but there's a real challenge today in modern discourse and strategic studies communities about what are the determinants of power, what is the relevance of sort of population. And so there's a clear essence that you need to have some population to be a great power. But if, if having population was to make a great power, then like Pakistan, Nigeria, and Indonesia would be tremendous powers, and they're all much more populous than Russia, but they're not, right? So. Um, to me, just to be clear, that given, given the base of the Russian economy and given, given at least what I understand to be the current character of war, as I've described it, a decline of 10 to 15 percent of Russian population over the next 50 years will not equal a decline of 10 percent in Russian military power or a decline in 10 percent of the Russian economy. And that's just my basic view of what that means. Um, and that, and that's important to remember that, well, at least in Russia's case, Russia is the main labor market for the former Soviet Union, right? And so it, it serves as, as um, the, the, the market of choice for everybody else to, for labor migration to send remittances back home. So it's access to a tremendously large labor pool surrounding itself with actually reasonably high birth rates. Yeah, look, this obviously brings us back to the social cultural dimension of this. And I'm reminded each time uh, several students have come through World College and done research papers with me, and they uh, often want to focus on the passion element of Trinity. And, and the question is, what has happened to uh, the warlike spirit of, of the American populace? Not supporting us in Iraq, Afghanistan, or anywhere else. Um, yeah, they, they stand and applaud at football games, but they don't really get what the military is and what it does. And uh, so they feel, <coughs> students feel cut off, and they don't understand. Um, so obviously we need to do a lot more analytical work in that dimension to try to make them understand. I try to tell my students, well, look, by design, we, the all-volunteer force wasn't supposed to require massive popular support in order to uh, be used uh, as an instrument of policy. I mean, we learned our lesson. The, the things that Coswell doesn't tell you about warlike spirit is how difficult it can be to put a lid back on that at some point in order to make uh, repeat policy rational, uh, limited, and well-defined, so. Uh. Thank you. Um, so now I'll open it up to the audience, and I'd like to remind you that, again, a trap door will open up if your question is not a question. Um, I saw you first, so please. Uh, I, uh, Major Matasek uh, with Air Force Academy. Uh, I want to be actually a little optimistic here, because uh, Something we haven't really talked about, and I think is actually a great discussion point, was back in February. For those of you who don't remember, back in February, Russian troops on holiday with their local Syrian militias and troops uh, got into a little firefight with the Americans, and it didn't go well for them at all. And I just kind of wanted to kind of get your guys' sort of take on first why uh, this hasn't really been talked about much still. It seems to be sort of uh, keeping on the DL and sort of uh, what you think this are, is in terms of implications for kind of what you're going to see it play out there and also elsewhere. I'm, I, I'm happy to take that. Um, yeah, well, it, it was immensely covered by our media at the time here. It was actually covered pretty well by Russian media and did not have much political effect in Russia because 
um, Wagner Group or PMCs, and they're there to be used in the traditional mercenary role, which is um, to be supported by Russian forces to take casualties and attrition out. And politically, they're highly expendable. There's no political cost to use them. Nobody cares about them in Russia. Uh, in terms of what well, it was, it's actually a really interesting encounter um, in, in indirect warfare between uh, uh, Russian state and ourselves, right? Because that, that could be viewed in one of two ways. One is just a very interesting test to see what our reaction was, remembering that due to nuclear weapons deterring at least conventional war and then giving us at least this limited, wonderful limited conventional war uh, option, uh, in which case whether you have 10 or 20 percent more population won't really make a lick of difference, um, countries fundamentally are forced to compete, uh, at least peer nuclear states, are forced to compete in indirect <coughs> warfare. And that's actually, um, that was the, really the profound uh, impact of the Cold War on the international system. In fact, Cold War was quite ironic and then reshaped the landscape of most countries, particularly outside of Europe, that the two powers never fought. But they engaged in proxy wars, coups, political warfare, assassination, and various other forms of indirect competition across all the other continents. They sort of displaced it. And so, if you, if, this is a bit, I like the structure of the answer. So if you think of World War I as like a bar fight between a bunch of people, the Cold War is a fight where two people managed to hit everybody else in the bar except for themselves over the course of 40 years, right? Um, and, and yeah, like they just, it was a massive standoff. They got very large and they literally hit everyone and everything they could find except for themselves, right? And the one of them collapsed from a heart attack. And, and, and no, but that's the reality of it. I hate to deny, I heard a great story in 1989 how the United States strangled the Soviet Union this morning. I lived in the Soviet Union in 1999. Don't remember it going that way, but that's fine. Um, so the, the, the Wagner group, we should look at as one, okay, it, it's, it, is, it is a very good probing attack to see what the U.S. reaction would be. Two, it's important to also see the Russian state as fundamentally in many ways um, an ad hocracy and uh, there, there are many sort of uh, parallel authorities there and people with freedom of action to try and test interesting things, especially if there's possible or implausible deniability. And so, um, in many times, at least in the current competition, what we're seeing now is just a lot of uh, testing and experimenting with things, because at least in my mind, analogy is imperfect, but we're kind of very much, from the Russian perspective, very much back in the 1960s. Those sorts of new and interesting stuff to do, to try, and you're not sure how it's going to go. And you're going to go get blowback from a lot of it, right? You don't know, you don't know what's going to be a successful form of course of diplomacy. You don't know if it's possible to do a fait accompli with a proxy force. You don't know how it's going to pan out, and you sort of, you sort of gauge the reaction. I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, so, so it didn't go well for them. But then again, when they killed all of our proxies in Syria, and, and it didn't go well for us. So, so I'm going to say that this is kind of typical American behavior. Uh, we say nothing about cruise missiles going out of the Caspian in Syria. We say nothing about Russian bombing. There's no response to it, but we kick 100 mercenaries' asses. And that's completely irrelevant to the problem that Michael's talking about. Yeah. Hi, Al Maroney from the uh, Air War College. I have a question since a, a couple of you talked about nuclear weapons. Uh, given the possibility that our competition with the great powers and North Korea will involve nuclear warfare. Do you believe the Army is adequately uh, prepared to talk, uh, develop concepts around uh, conflict in a nuclear environment? Should the Army be more involved in strategic deterrence discussions that currently the Air Force has dominated for the last 10 years or so? I'll take the Army piece that. I mean, I grew up in an Army where every howitzer in the Army, except for 105s, had a nuclear mission. Um, when you talk to, to pe people, don't even know what PRP spells anymore, um, where we've lost, there's just no consciousness of that possibility. And what I thought was interesting with Michael's uh, yesterday's intervention is we just don't want to talk about that this is a plausible thing at the tactical and operational level because an adversary who thinks about these as weapons, not as weapons of strategic effect at certain levels. And we're unprepared. Um, I mean, we, we've just completely lost in the last 15 years any understanding of uh, not just chemical and nuclear, but biological. I mean, I was in a unit giving a talk uh, that may have had to go to Syria, and that's all I can say. But they didn't have chemical protective gear. They never practiced with it. They had masks. But you know, their suits are Cold War suits because we haven't thought about it. So this is, I think, we talk about the urban environment. We're going to be in an environment that's dirty, mm -hmm. 
uh, intentionally and unintentionally in some cases, and I think we've completely forgotten how to do it. The Army can't have a discussion yet about tactical use of these weapons uh, and doesn't even understand the dimension of the strategic use. But then what you get in the War College about, you know, we have a nuclear threshold and mm -hmm. it's a strategic problem. I'll, I'll, I'll come in, completely agree with Dave, I'll come in on the nuclear part of it. So it's, it's a real challenge for us because we're actually living through a, a real second period of nuclear modernization yeah. and qualitative change in nuclear weapons and the nuclear propulsion of weapons. Um, and, and at least the other powers are quite vested in it. Um, the United States has chosen to unilaterally disarm um, when it comes to basically all non-strategic nuclear weapons and leave a small tactical arsenal primarily for assurance purposes because NATO is a nuclear alliance. Um, but it cer certainly wouldn't deter anyone. And, and then that created real, real uh, big, big problems when you think about modern warfare with peers. So if you're talking about counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, it's hard to have that conversation without ever talking about the civilian population, whatever country you're going to fight at. And if you're talking about peer conflict, and if you're not going to talk about nuclear weapons, you have a big problem. Because here's the thing, at least from my perspective. To have a theory of a great power war, you have to have a theory of escalation management of war termination. And so today, Russia can go to war with the United States, but the United States cannot go to war with Russia. Because Russia's thought very hard about what escalation management in that conflict would look like and what successful war termination strategies short of strategic nuclear exchange might be, based on the objectives, asymmetry of interest at stake, and correlation of forces and means. And they cannot get this conversation in Washington, D.C., right, at all. Like, it, it's very difficult. The only conversation you can get, and this is from people who wrote the NPR, is you can't project conventional power unless you can deter nuclear use. Okay, what's your plan for that? How, this is what I said earlier. What is your theory of having a large-scale conventional conflict with a power and they will agree to lose and not use nuclear weapons? No one ever thought that way from 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You're like, this is the first generation to even, to believe in this mythical creature. Um, so the challenge is really, we thinking of what a nuclear battlefield looks like today. Nuclear weapons characteristically are different. Because means of delivery are very accurate, yields are much more precise, so they can be used without collateral damage. They can be used for specialized effects, right? So it's possible to successfully nuke West Point but not hurt the people across that river, right? It's now, it's now a somewhat very different nuclear battlefield from what it was before, and we need to, I think, think a lot harder about what that looks like, particularly for the ground fight because, well, you know who the prime target for being nuked is, it's people on the ground. Thanks, we'll move to the next question, Ali. Uh, so we hear a lot that the, the United States is in an era of, uh, a new era of great power competition, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. I mean, what should America's long, what should America strive for in its long-term relationships with China and Russia, assuming that we are competing with them, but presumably we don't want indefinite conflict? This is a sort of a lazy thing to say, but I, I think it's the truest answer to that, which is, we really got to get our house in order. I mean, things are real fucked up right now. And, you know, luckily for us, uh, things are real fucked up in China right now. I mean, I think one of the things that we miss when we're having this conversation is just how afraid everyone is of Xi Jinping and how careful people are to step out of the boundary and how much people talk about Belt and Road because their superiors told them to talk about Belt and Road and they think it's a safe thing to say. So it, it's, we know so much less about the situation in the halls of, of power in Zhongnanhai than we do about the dysfunction in the White House, but Beijing is, is a far less competent polity than I think a lot of us assume. And you know, Thomas Friedman will go over and notice that this Davos Hall was built in eight months, and then you actually go and, and wander around Beijing. And so just to you know, give another equally superficial anecdote, um, a good friend of mine lives in an apartment building in Beijing, nice upper middle class housing, uh, the elevator's floor has been broken for maybe 10 years. So it's sort of like a dirt floor in the elevator. When you push uh, 19, it stops at 18. And you know, there, there's so much that does not work in Beijing. And I think we need to recognize that when we're, when we're thinking about these things. So I, I think we're back to the situation we were after World War II in some ways, where, well, actually back to where we were in the 40s, where there are two pure competitors uh, that are regionally stronger than we are in the regions. And how did you come to grips with that? Uh, I think we made some real missteps with the Japanese with oil, unknowingly. 
but how do you manage what your place in the world is with your interests that are actually vital, not peripheral or important, and design a strategy that says, you know, where will I give and take, and, you know, how do I accommodate coexistence in a way that doesn't threaten those interests and values? Uh, and there will probably be confrontation because they conflict. Um, but understanding that, you know, I'm, the competition, the war, the conflict, whatever it is, we need a new vernacular to discuss the world we're actually in. Because we keep going back to these old analogies. And it's like the Kennedy administration was, was fundamentally shaped by Munich when it was discussing the Cuban Missile Crisis. Completely irrelevant. As it turned out, there were already 69 warheads on Cuba before we put the embargo in place. So how do you frame a new strategy with a new way of thinking about the challenge you have now, rather than trying to frame it in challenges of the past. And that's most of the discourse we're having about Russia, and it transfers over to China because we have no other mental model about what strategy is. Right. Um, if I could add to this, I, I think of course one of the fundamental challenges is understanding what is the competition actually over, what does Russia want, let's yeah. say, and, and what do we want. And a lot of times, I, it's frustrating because a lot, a lot of strategic Thinking about the competition is very much like interwar first half of the 20th century period. People right. think it's about land because land has people and resources and stuff on it, right? Because countries are like trying to get stronger for industrial scale warfare. That's not what the competition is about at all with Russia. And, and, and like, I don't necessarily think with China either. But, um, you know, I think for the United States, there's a couple of challenges. One, um, I don't maintain position, U.S. position as a leader of the international order post unipolarity when the balance, structural balance of power is obviously invisibly changed. It's already a lagging indicator. Two, um, how to successfully deter other great powers from encroaching allies. The United States is an insurance company. They gave out a million insurance policies to everybody during a period when it was like the only power in the international system. And now regional uh, balance of power has changed, both in Europe and Asia Pacific region. The United States is sitting very eerily watching like this, saying, I hope none of these gets challenged or contested because there's going to be some pretty big credibility issues real fast. Three, there's a big problem in negotiating the current international order. The international order we're, we're in is the post-Cold War one. That was underwritten by the only power that existed then. Uh, Russia does not subscribe to this international order. Most importantly, it does not subscribe to the security architecture of Europe. It has no stake in it. That's the biggest problem, really. Right? And it's very revisionist in that sense. Okay? So, and, and there are big normative differences in U.S. outlook on the international system, particularly with Moscow, that are fundamental differences of perspective. Like, Russia has a very, very strong preference for a Yalta-style 1945 distribution of power that is an order where, where regional hegemons are responsible for security in the region and a concert of Europe-type arbitration system. It is very, very, very much driven by status recognition. Um, and there's a big normative difference between our outlook, too. So Russia's very classical belief that only great powers have real sovereignty in the international system, and little countries mm -hmm. don't. They have limited sovereignty. It's not like just about Russia's near abroad. It's about, it's about all countries that are not great powers. Um, just to add a very quick point, I think we forget that World War II, China fought with the United States against Japan. And part of the reason that Mao opened up to the US was because he was afraid of the Soviet Union. And China was an ally in taking down the Soviet Union in the 80s. So I personally think that China and Russia have more to fear from each other than they do from us. And I think who's going to win if there's a winner in this next thing will be whichever side of the triangle combines with another side. So, is there so, I'd like to take a couple more questions, right. if we can. I have some for myself. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I see five placards up. I'm gonna take three right now and see, and do some dealer's choice. So we're gonna start right here. Then we'll go to Dr. Gartsy and to Max. Mal, I'm an Army JAG and MWI fellow. Um, I have a question for Dr. Johnson about innovation and uh, our history and our future with it. I want to use AI not as an example of innovation, but as an analogy for innovation. And you know, many AI thinkers like Kurzweil think of uh, AI as this ever-developing virtuous cycle. The more AI we get, the better it'll get. It will itself develop better AI, and so on and so on and so on until you get to the singularity. The way that uh, General Wesley kind of described innovation, the way I think I think you probably think of it too, is the sine wave where we have periods of interest and ability to innovate, and then we have troughs. Um, and we're generally in that trough. Do you think that uh, the US military 
and even the US government writ large is structurally capable of generating a virtuous cycle of innovation? Or are we just not built for that? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you. I'm, I'm trying to uh, pose my question in the form of a comment, as you suggested. Um, <laughs> so, this, um, so, so this question, are we at war, keeps coming up. And uh, I think it's important to define our terms. But as a social scientist, I don't believe in our definitions. So um, I would rather ask the question, uh, how do we compete in a setting in which uh, one definition of war, main force battle, is uh, mutually un unattractive or collectively unattractive. And one of the things that just came up was this idea that Moscow and Beijing aren't best friends. Um, can you talk about maybe some ways in which uh, we can play this grand strategic game in, in intelligent ways that emphasize the tensions between the two parties that worry us the most? You said about Grindr makes me think about Tinder, which also makes me super grateful that I'm married. Um, <laughs> but it goes back to what we talked about yesterday about how propaganda, uh, Russian propaganda, Chinese propaganda, isn't especially online, is not just directed at our voters, but also specifically to drive a wedge in our military. And so my question is, and this can be for the entire panel, is like any disease, what can we do to vaccinate and inoculate our soldiers from blackmail and from propaganda to maintain cohesion. All right, so first question was for Dr. Johnson, okay. so we'll start with you. So I think my quick answer is I think we adapt when we realize we're failing. Uh, it's really hard. I don't think you can innovate unless you have a problem you're trying to solve. Um, and. We tend to, I mean, a lot of the conference this week was, this is going to change everything, or no, it's not. Or, so it's just, my wife was a China scholar for years, and she had a friend who once said, you know, the problem with Americans, you either underwhelm or overwhelm. <laughs> if you ever learned to whelm, you'd really be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So I think the, the challenge is, is there a universal conception in the Army of what are the problems we're trying to solve? And I think, as I said, you need a a set of adversaries that you try and really understand what their capabilities are. You have to locate it in a place, because it's very different in the Pacific than in Europe. And you have to understand your adversaries' capabilities and, and how do you, you know, think imaginatively when your concept of how do you take those things away from them. Uh, I, I think we're starting that. That's why I'm, I think Futures Command is so important. But I mean, I think Fundamentally, I mean, the, this is the Alcoholics Anonymous approach to innovation. You know, you got to stand up and say, my name is General Smith, I can't win the war in Russia. And what are the 12 steps? Until you say that I'm not the best army in the world, yeah. you will think you are. And if you measure yourself against armies that are not the best, they're really problematic right now. I think in terms of vaccinating, the, the biggest worry for me, uh, or at least one that seems to be the most underappreciated is the role that former generals, former US government officials play in extending and parroting Beijing's message because of this. So there is a lot of people, a lot of ex-colleagues of yours who now work as consultants or who work for major companies that need to have a good relationship with China. And they recognize that in order for them to be helpful interlocutors, they can't speak publicly about fears they have of Beijing's military threat or what Beijing is doing in the South Sea or the East Sea. And you know, there, there's some very, very specific examples. There's a, a former admiral uh, whose name rhymes with Bowens who has done a lot of consulting uh, with Huawei. And around the time, I think it was maybe nine or 10 years ago, he wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times after meeting with uh, people with generals from Beijing arguing about the need to have a softer approach and a weaker relationship with Taiwan. And he's an influential person and not, you know, getting money out of politics is a big conversation that we have in domestic focused US debate, but we don't talk about it with getting Chinese money out of the hands of ex-officials who make a lot of money from that. Uh, another thing just on this issue of competition, this is less attractive for Russia, but um, this is a good excuse for me to bring up the situation in Xinjiang, 
Northwest China where there are roughly a million Muslims in concentration camps. We have the ability, we, we never want to try to out China China. The reason that America is the global leader is in part because of our values and because of our soft power and because of this idea of America as a beacon of democracy. So I'm surprised that the government has not done a lot more to remind Muslim countries and to remind countries around the world about the horrific situation in Xinjiang as a way of saying, we still have our values and oh great, I mean that's fantastic that you want to trade with China, but they do have a million Muslims in concentration camps. That is bad. Thank you. Um, if I can jump in. I had one point of difference with Isaac, which is that um, over the last five years, I think it's clear that Moscow has chosen not to see Russia's, not to see China's rise as a threat. And that's the reality of it because they have no options. So, I mean, a Russian self-assessment places them as quite resurgent uh, relative to the United States and dramatically in decline relative to China, and they really have no option, right? And so they've already made their bet, that particularly after 2014, they literally have nobody else to partner with. Um, and looking at it, they don't really have any serious core interests in conflict with China either. And so what's really come is a realization that after this confrontation with the United States, which looks like it's going to be quite prolonged, um, the best Russian hope is to support China in challenging the United States for leadership in the international order to change its nature, because anything that comes is better for Moscow than this, in this current scenario. The big debate and the big question is, of course, will powers principally make alliances in response to threats, right? The sort of like often you hear discourse that it's a very normative dialogue that countries, like countries make alliances as part of some dating service because they like each other and they have similar political value systems and all that and that's why we're such good allies with Saudi Arabia because of all our value similarities. Um, you know, and, and that's why India was partnered with the Soviet Union during the Cold War because they were the largest democracy and Soviet Union was the largest totalitarian state and it's such a natural alignment. Um, and, and, and so, because it's not true, historically it's completely banal and not true, um, the reality is that there's a couple options. One, Chinese haven't made their choice yet. And so they're deciding to what extent is, is a real sh shared threat from the United States likely to, help, I think, push them into a, a balancing alliance. I don't know if that'll take place. I don't know if there'll be some kind of entente, and if it does, it'll take years. At the very least, it'll be political. I don't know if it'll ever be military. I kind of doubt it. Um, the other one is, well, Potentially, it could be, it could be a bandwagon entente. And if you read the, the public face of the NDS, it has a sort of language posturing. It's a US ideological normative language. Russia autocratic, China autocratic, want to do some kind of autocratic stuff in the world. You know, like that together. That's, that's what it reads like. Um, I don't actually think the United States has any good cards to play and that there's no, there's no part of this game in which the United States makes a deal with Russia and convinces Russia to side against China. I just don't see it. And most of it is determined by the pace of U.S. confrontation with China. The extent to which the Chinese decide that the confrontation really is on is the extent to which they have no alternative but at least to, to secure partnership with Russia. And the very, like, very brief comment on, on Max's great question. Um, I will simply help admire the problem and, and, and make it bigger to what you said because I don't have a good answer to it. One of the things that's very different from this current competition from the Cold War is that indirect competition, political information warfare in the Cold War was highly peripheral. And there was no way for the United States or Soviet Union to directly shape each other's systems or attack that which the countries existentially hold in value. And so that allowed them to screw up lots of other countries and engage in complex operations, but most of which were nuisance operations. There was a lot of noise and it annoyed the two political systems, but they didn't really do anything. It was activity in place of achievement. In this modern competition, there is the ability of that power, this, I tried to do an article on this called Great Power Rating and Brigandry, which basically talk about how we, in many, in many ways, parts of competition go back to pre-nation state system, right? Which is essentially that one country can reach out and through indirect warfare, substantially damage, weaken um, another country and hold at risk that which their political system at least values. And values all that counts. Values all that counts in the day. And that was not possible during the 20th century competition. I don't know, I don't have brilliant answers on this yet, but I'm, but I'm willing to admire the problem with you. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and just on uh, Max's question real quick, I would fall back on a liberal solution to everything, which is education. <laughs> You know, we can't take the cell phones away, can't keep them off of social media, all that. But part of the education, I think, ought to stress that we've had these problems going way back. We've always been part of U.S. military, racial, ethnic strife, uh, all of that. Accept that it was there, that it wasn't a good thing, so on. Try to explain why we can, why getting along is better and all of that. I mean, it, I think we're working on it. I think we're probably getting better from what I can see. Probably still have a ways to go to prevent uh, because now, you know, as you pointed out, the uh, intrusion of other views and uh, the manipulation of images and everything else is, 
has intensified. So I probably need to ramp up those efforts a little bit more. I would think. All right. So we did very well on time. We have 15 seconds left. So please join me in thanking this terrific panel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take a 15-minute break before our final speaker for the day. We reconvene at 1045.